Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've got folks entering here as we get ready to uh, get this conversation started. I'm Deb Meislish, and I'm an associate director at CRLT, and I'm happy to be collaborating with our colleagues at Allison A to arrange this program, reflecting on lessons from this fall as we continue to prepare for winter 2021. Um, we will get started with the panel in just a few minutes, but I wanted to let you know that in addition to all of you and our wonderful panelists, there are some other folks on this call. In particular from LSNA, we have Tim McKay, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education, Rashonda Flint, Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Education and Student Academic Affairs, Chris O'Neill, the Deputy Assistant Dean in Student Academic Affairs, and Moni Dressler, the Director of LSNA's Academic Technology Services. And then from CRLT, uh, in addition to myself, Matt Kaplan, our Executive Director, and my colleague Josh Caldwell, who's managing all the Zoom things. To get us started and set the stage for this conversation, I'm going to turn things over to Tim McKay, who's going to um, make some initial comments, and then we'll come back to introduce the panel and talk about how we're going to move forward. So, Tim. All right. Thank you very much, Deb. And I, I do I want to basically start off with gratitude. Uh, obviously, the fall 2020 semester has been incredibly challenging, and as we bring it to a close, I want to personally offer my thanks to all the faculty, staff, and students who've been working together to keep LSNA's educational mission moving forward. It has taken all of us to do this. It's clear that the work you were required to do was substantially greater than in normal times and that the circumstances in which you had to do this work of course made the task even harder. I also want to thank the leadership and staff at the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching and LSNA Technology Services team for all the things they've done to help us survive the last year but also in perhaps, perhaps especially for helping to arrange today's faculty panel. Recent develop developments, including this morning, give us hope that we will emerge from this pandemic during the coming year. I'm not sure you all seen the news yet, but vaccine doses have arrived at the University of Michigan Hospital and will be given to some of the healthcare workers there starting today. So that's wow. exciting, exciting news for us. It's wonderful, it's kind of restorative news. And as we begin to look ahead, to the winter 2021 semester, we're all looking for ways to share with you some reflections and guidance about teaching in this mostly remote environment. Advice that's based on what we all as a community have learned over the last year. Now, as we develop this advice, I hope that we will all draw on insights gleaned from many sources, including the winter planning surveys that we sent out to students, faculty, and staff in October. There's also an emerging scholarly conversation about teaching and learning during the pandemic that I hope you're all keeping an eye on. I found the student survey that was done to support winter planning especially important for general insights. And I would encourage you all to take a look at the report and we'll put a link to, to where you can find it uh, into, the, into the chat. The key issues that students raised kind of across the board are worth thinking about in, in the context of every course that we might teach now. They involve connecting with instructors and one another, finding that those connections were both extremely important and also difficult to make and to sustain. Partly as a result of this difficulty of connecting, students struggled in the fall term with motivation, with organization in some ways, and with a sense of belonging to the environment that they were working in. We heard very clearly, and it's not just us, in fact, universities across the country heard very clearly that the workload students experienced was more than they expected or had experienced in the past. And there are good reasons for this that I hope we'll discuss at some point during this panel. Um, some students found accessing remote course materials difficult. And this is a thing that needs to be kept in mind. For most of those students, the difficulty in, in accessing things was occasional. I would say maybe 25% of the students talked about occasionally struggling to access remote course materials to be able to log into class in a synchronous course or to get at materials they needed. But about 5% of students found it very difficult to access course materials on a regular basis. So we have to remember that too, that although most of our students are in a good position to do this, some are not. And then the last thing that really struck me from the student surveys that we did 
was a sense that our students expressed that while most of them expressed a sense of belonging to the University of Michigan writ large, they sometimes felt as if they were not valued themselves as individuals, either by the institution or occasionally by some of their instructors. So my hope is that we'll look at the results from these fall surveys and think about ways that we can refine our courses for winter term to address these kinds of concerns in every way that's possible. And there are lots of advice that's being shared in lots of different forums for you right now, including the Allison A Technology Services Tip of the Week sessions and so on. And I hope you will take advantage of those as you think about modifications you might make for your own class in the winter term. The main uh, subject of business today here, though, is the faculty panel. And so to get started on that, I'm going to turn things back over to Deb Meiselis, who will introduce our panelists and get us started. Super. Thanks, Tim. So we're lucky to be joined by the following faculty for our panel today. Umaya Cable from American Culture and Film, Television and Media Studies, Nicole Tuttle from Chemistry, David Miller from Economics, and Paulina Alberto and Farina Mir from, well, Paulina, History and Spanish, Farina from History. And the two of them are going to jointly talk about a course that they co-taught. Um, as we move forward here, we invite you to put questions for the panelists in the chat. Um, uh, on Friday during our session, there was an active uh, set of Q&As going on in the chat, but Matt Kaplan and Moni Dressler will also be collecting sort of the meatier questions um, uh, and less maybe specific questions from the chat for uh, posing to the panelists when we get to the Q&A. But you are welcome. Um, there's a wealth of experience and knowledge on this call from all directions, and you are welcome to uh, respond and answer questions that your colleagues are posing as we go along as well. So with that, I believe we will turn to the panel. We're going to move in alphabetical order by discipline. And so that means that Umaya Cable, I'm going to turn things over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Umaya Cable, and I'm going to share my screen with you in just a moment or um, a portion of my screen. OK, so um, I have a very um, kind of bullet point approach to this conversation. I'm just going to share with you five strategies that worked for my classes this semester. Um, I'm new to the University of Michigan. This was my first semester teaching here. Um, and I was teaching a class in FTVM called Media Activism and a class in American Culture called Stereotypes in American Culture. Um, they were both between 25 and 35 students, so pretty small seminar style classes. Um, and yeah, I'll just jump right into strategy number one. Um, so the first suggestion I have is just to embrace the weird factor. Um, I acknowledged right off the bat and pretty much in every class that this is an unusual circumstance for everyone and um, kind of took it as an opportunity to be a little bit weird. Um, and one way I did that was through icebreakers and polls. So I did um, one of the icebreakers I've done, is, which is pretty popular, is um, um, is cereal a kind of soup? And that kind of opened up a conversation among students to kind of debate in a fun way and a very lighthearted way um, whether cereal is a kind of soup. Um, so that was kind of one of the early ways to get people to relax a little bit, myself included. Um, and then I would poll students periodically um, and not just like, how are you feeling, but kind of giving them an opportunity to flex a little bit of um, creative thinking. So I asked them, you know, what animal describes your mood today? And, you know, aside from the, the usual dog and cat, um, there was, uh, you know, sloth and uh, raccoon, octopus. Another one was, what color do you feel like today? Giving people the opportunity to <laughs> kind of think outside of, you know, primary colors or black and white dynamics and thinking about um, pink, purple, red, yellow. Um, and that was just a way to kind of get people to loosen up and feel a little looser. Um, strategy number two was I used a mix of synchronous and asynchronous participation um, because I recognized that student not everyone could access the um, synchronous classes. Sorry, my dog is dreaming and he's growling in his sleep. Um, so I had a series of 12 opportunities for blog posts throughout the semester and you had to complete six uh, minimum, but if you did more than six, uh, students got extra credit so for participation. So that was one way that if they couldn't attend um, synchronous discussion classes, they could make it up asynchronously. 
Another uh, part of asynchronous participation was making rewarding outside engagement. So I had a discussion thread devoted to pop culture, news, um, film, television, social media, anything that they found relevant to our topics of discussion, they could write a short 250 word post um, that just related the material of our class to things out in the world. Um, and really that was kind of an, an attempt to get them to, to, to have them for me to acknowledge that their perspectives were valued outside of the classroom as well. Um, strategy number three was I found it very challenging or I noticed that students had a very hard time talking to each other or across the class. Um, so student to student discussion was pretty hard. Um, and so it was all kind of being directed and, and and kind of, I was a vector for their discussion. And one way that I sort of managed that was that I would start to connect their dots and link um, people's comments by name and say, you know, when Melissa said X, it related to Josh's comment about Y. Um, and this kind of helped to model for the class how they can also start to do that. And I, I did notice that they did pick it up towards the end of the class, but it did take a lot of doing that to get them to kind of start to, um, refer to their classmates by name, which was great by the end of the semester. Um, so I really enjoyed that because it also sort of took the pressure off of me to constantly be the point person, but it did, it took a lot of groundwork to begin with. Um, the fourth point was that I reimagined the final project. I had originally planned on having a traditional final academic paper and halfway through the semester, I not only scrapped my whole syllabus and rewrote it, um, but I also reconfigured the final project. Um, and I really thought carefully about what would be a practical or meaningful application of our course material. Um, so I gave my students two options. Um, one was to write a letter home to either a friend or family member or someone important. Uh, and some students chose, you know, some really, you know, there were some typical direct letters to parents, uncles, aunts, et cetera. Um, some people chose to write to themselves before joining the class or to themselves in the first year of college. Others chose to write to kind of important political figures. So that was, it, it was kind of interesting to see how they approached that project. Um, and the other was a zine, uh, which was just an opportunity, especially in media activism, for students to practice um, visualizing information, how to represent information in a visual way, and um, how to communicate it in a visual and a narrative fashion. Um, and that was kind of maybe more particular to my media activism class, but I, I know other folks who have used zines as their final project, and it gives students a chance to kind of flex their creative muscles, but also um, you know, use the, the material that we've learned just in a way that's outside of a, an, a strict academic paper. And then the um, fifth and final point I have is that I just, I, I really chose honesty at every turn. Um, I acknowledged that this was a very difficult semester um, and I did my best to relate to students. Um, and I, I also kind of opened up about my own concerns about you know being new to Ann Arbor, not knowing anyone and being stuck at home and how awkward that was. And um, I think that that helped to kind of, for them to realize that I was also a person in, in weird circumstances. Um, and then the last part of that honesty was just emphasizing that this learning, all learning is a process and not a product. Um, I made clear that I didn't expect them to master the information in this class in this given semester, but that I hoped that they would carry this information with them throughout the rest of the semester or throughout the rest of the, um, their college you know, journeys and maybe even after college that maybe one day this information would pop back up in their brains um, and be useful somehow. So um, those were my five strategies and I guess I will leave it at that. So thank you. Thank you, Amaya. You've already done a great job kicking us off here and, and addressing some of the themes that we ask all of the panelists to address, things like building community in this moment, things like engaging students, and things about sort of considering what, what's, the, what's the appropriate approach to the workload in this moment, both in terms of the types of assignments, even rethinking assignments. And so you've, you've helped set the stage in important ways. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, our to Nicole Tuttle from Chemistry. Hi, everybody. Um, so nice to be here. Um, this is Eleanor, by the way. Um, she's probably going to be hanging out with us for a bit. 
Um, and I just wanted to say um, before starting that Umaya, I'm also in my first semester here teaching full time. And um, so I feel you. It's been interesting. Um, there's been some joy, but also some challenges. Um, so I wanted to speak about the two courses that I taught this semester, which are really a study in contrast. So I taught, I'm teaching in organic chemistry and also I'm in the comprehensive studies program. So one of my courses is a large lecture. Um, I taught second semester organic chemistry. So an intro course, mostly taken by sophomores and juniors, um, 300 to 400 people. Whereas my other course is a small seminar style with um, about 18 to 20 students per section. And that's aimed at CSP students and it's meant to accompany first semester organic chemistry. Um, and so I'm working under a number of constraints in these two courses. Um, so obviously in the large lecture course, large numbers make it challenging. It's always challenging um, to teach a large lecture course, but particularly under these conditions that brings a new set of challenges. Um, there's also curricular constraints. So the department you know, has eight to 10 people who regularly teach these courses and there's an agreed upon set of curricula. And so there is pressure to maintain that um, and to stick with a certain pacing. And so um, that was a, definitely a theme throughout the semester in terms of planning and um, uh, instruction. So, the way that I ended up planning these two courses and um, my large lecture I was co-teaching with uh, uh, Brian Coppola, um, we decided to make that course largely asynchronous. So using lecture recordings, um, using a discussion board to solicit questions from students and then posting video responses to those in lieu of having live office hours. Um, Having weekly quizzes, which was a new development, um, really nice because historically this course has been run with paper exams um, and we moved that all online and that actually opened up the door to be able to use weekly quizzes um, since it, the grading process gets you know, significantly simplified, which I actually think was a really fantastic addition and um, I've been keeping an ongoing list of changes that have come about as a result of the pandemic that will stay, I think over the long term, and I see this being one of those. Um, so a lot of these decisions were made for reasons of practicality, um, both in not wanting to overload ourselves with work this semester, just recognizing the work that was gonna go into um, delivering a course uh, online, um, but also because of dealing with large okay. numbers of students. So I did work to add some things that I thought could help build some community in the course or help students make connections to me, if not to each other. Um, so, so one thing that I did was um, host a number of meet and greets very early in the semester. Just come for 20 minutes with five to eight of your classmates and uh, meet your instructor. So I'm, I'm a human being and you can talk to me. And um, a lot of students took me up on that. And it was really, I think, um, lovely addition to the course. I'm really glad we did it. And we didn't talk about a whole lot of meaningful stuff, but it was a way to connect and, um, you know, for me to get to hear from some people, which is something that I certainly missed out on this semester um, a fair amount. Um, I also, with every recorded lecture, posted a brief announcements just to make it feel timely, to make it feel like we were keeping up a pace. And I tried with every announcement to include either some kind of encouragement related to the course and how it was going, like, hey, we're halfway through the semester or great job on your exam yesterday. But I also included personal tidbits about myself. Um, so the occasional picture of these guys, um, of my pets, just sort of little sprinklings in there of what's happening in my life um, as a way to further those connections and make them feel like there's an actual human being um, at the other end of the email. Um, let's see, I have to say, we had made some of these decisions about running things asynchronously because we knew we had a number of students studying internationally. And so we were very concerned about being able to accommodate people on both sides of uh, the globe. Um, but we found that this largely asynchronous um, modality was unsatisfying in some ways, and I'm sure that students felt that too. So we actually ended up 
bringing in live review sessions before each of the two exams. And since there were two of us, we were able to manage this by me running the AM shift and Brian running the PM shift so that we were able to accommodate students on both sides of the globe. Um, and that was, I think, a big important lesson that I'm taking forward for next semester that I don't love this particular modality and I wanna switch it up. Okay, thanks. All right, so I'll just speak for a minute about the other course, which was, um, like I said, a small uh, seminar style course meant to accompany uh, first semester organic chemistry, and it's designed for students in the comprehensive studies program. So part of the idea is, of this course was really to build more structure into the first semester organic course, which is largely unstructured. It tends to be lecture and discussion run, um, but there's no assigned homework or anything. And so this is a way of helping students connect with each other um, and also with the material, with having assignments and things like that. Um, it's a one credit course, so I was concerned about workload. Um, but I decided to um, leverage synchronous interactions much more in this course, um, both through weekly meetings that were held synchronously on Zoom, but also by assigning uh, students to teams in the first week of the semester and then uh, using uh, regular group assignments to give them a chance to talk to one another. So I put a fair amount of structure into the groups. Um, so I had the groups, uh, work together in the first week to write a contract for how they were going to engage with one another to and to set some goals for what they wanted to accomplish together. And um, to my great pleasure and somewhat surprise, I guess, because um, you just never know the first time you're trying something, um, this worked extremely well. And I heard from students both in midterm feedback and in their group feedback, um, but also just unsolicited near the end of the semester, how meaningful they'd found this group work during the semester, how, how much they, they really appreciated the connections that they were able to make to other students. Um, and there was clear indications that they were spending time beyond chemistry, talking about you know, other things out in their lives and so on. And so that was really wonderful to hear. Um, because building community was such an important part of thinking about this course, and it has been such a challenge this semester in so many ways. Um, it's not the only thing that I did to work to build community in that course. So in addition to that, I also incorporated a weekly check-in. So similar to what Maya was describing, of just uh, <clears throat> giving every student in the, in the class a chance to speak up and say something about what's going on in their life that week. And um, I think that we all really treasured that as well. We heard about nieces being born and family members um, feeling better and also just uh, the search for candy corn, which was difficult this year for some reason. So um, both some really profound things, but some really um, silly little things that are still on everyone's mind. And it was just a really nice way to connect. Um, it's one of the things I most look forward to. And I got the sense that my students really appreciated that too. Um, I also made a fair amount of use of breakout sessions during our synchronous meetings. So while I expected students to meet outside of class to complete their group assignments, I also wanted to give them a chance within class to talk to one another to do some problem solving um, as a nice pause and a way to connect with others. Um, I know it's something that they valued because most students kept their cameras off during our um, whole group discussions, but when I went to the breakouts, everybody had their cameras on and they're all talking to each other. So I know they're there. I know they're, they're listening. Um, even though I really let everybody just not have cameras, um, uh, they turn them on for each other, which is pretty cool. Um, one final thing I'll say about this is that I had also started the semester incorporating Yellow Dig as a discussion board, just wanting to give students a chance to talk to one another across those different sections. So broadly speaking in the class, also as sort of a source of support if they had specific chemistry questions that they could be answering for one another. But I ended up removing that about halfway through the semester. I found students felt overloaded and this is a one credit course. I did not want this to feel like a burden. And so um, I pulled that. I think it could be really valuable in the right context, but that context just was not this particular context this fall. Um, so I just wanted to conclude with sort of one important lesson that I've really taken from this semester and is influencing how I'm thinking about going into next semester. So next semester I will be teaching different courses, but with very similar formats, another large lecture course 
and a, another small seminar that accompanies um, second semester organic chemistry this time. So as I've found this asynchronous entire um, setup is just not working well. And also I've been thinking about how I can incorporate group work into my large lecture course. Many of those students in that lecture will be first year students. And so I know that this has been a challenge for them. And so um, I've upgraded my Zoom license to the big one so that I can have 300 plus students in Zoom um, in breakouts at the same time. And one nice feature of Zoom that you may or may not know is that you can pre-assign breakouts. And so I'm planning to assign breakouts at the beginning of the semester and keep those same ones throughout the entire semester. That will that way, every time that we're having a synchronous meeting and we are gonna have synchronous meetings, um, uh, focused on more on problem solving, um, in addition to accompanying some recorded lecture material. Um, I just want to give students a place to be able to check in and get to know one another and talk to one another um, as a structured part of the course. And so that is a major shift that I'm planning on um, as a result of this semester. So thanks, thanks. so much, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Your reflections here really help put um, again, several of these themes in play, both the sort of decisions about the different ways of engaging with students, the synchronous and asynchronous choices and your reflections on those, as well as um, the various ways in which you thought about building community, both with your students as an instructor, but also amongst the students. So thank you very much. Now we're gonna move to, uh, to David um, in economics. So David, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and go to uh, slides here. Um, so the course that I taught this semester was Economics 401, Intermediate Micro. Um, I have been teaching this course for a couple uh, of years now, and I'm still getting used to it. It's a central course in economics. Uh, it's required for all our majors. It is theoretical and mathematical, and my version of it is an opinionated version with no textbook, so I follow my own material. Um, it's a huge class with 440 students, and these are mostly sophomores and juniors, a lot of transfers uh, who are new to the university, uh, many students overseas this semester, um, and really a wide range of mathematical preparation. So I have a couple of principles that I uh, put together for this talk. Uh, this isn't necessarily all the principles, but these are important uh, in any semester. So this is an integrated theoretical framework at the core of economics. I focus on theoretical and logical reasoning and problem solving, which means that there's a few uh, format decisions which are kind of non-negotiable. Uh, the exams have to be problem solving exams that are hand graded by the GSIs. It's very time consuming, but it's, it's worthwhile. Um, and problem sets that I give out every week, they don't have to be graded or ungraded. I leave them ungraded because we don't have the GSI time to grade them all by hand, um, but I provide very detailed answer keys. I introduce mathematical tools that are beyond Math 115, which is the requirement that they all come in with. Um, part of the task is to build a community of economic students and faculty because this is their entree into the major. And I want to connect core ideas to research and life questions beyond the core. So I have to somehow accomplish all of these things uh, as best I can. So I wanted to focus on some highlights and lowlights from this semester. Uh, highlights the synchronous and asynchronous combination. Uh, a lot of the tech tools that we used, and I'll mention Canvas, uh, the broadcast setup that I have, and uh, Gradescope. The low lights were my time and sanity, uh, two pretty bad tech failures. Uh, six exams turned out to be too many, uh, and probable cheating. So I'll go through those not necessarily in order here. Um, the asynchronous and synchronous combo um, I decided to post asynchronous instructional videos. And these are basically the canonical content for the course because there's no textbook. This is what students need to refer to. And I assigned up to 40 minutes for a scheduled lecture because I didn't want to overwhelm them uh, with too much time. And I was able to do them in a way that was pretty succinct. Um, I have pre-prepped slides for these, but I fill in a lot of the details by hand, uh, particularly the graphs, but the algebra uh, and other annotations as well. Um, and I post those before and after slides. And the, the students indicated that they really like this slides with handwriting mode, which is actually what I do most of the time, except that uh, it's a little bit different in a pre recorded video, which is going to be edited down uh, for brevity. And then during my scheduled lecture time, 
I held synchronous sessions, um, which I called live lectures. And I only went for the first 40 minutes. So this way they would have 80 minutes of total lecture time per scheduled lecture, and I wouldn't be uh, giving them more lecture content than they would get in a normal semester. So for those first 40 minutes, um, well, actually for the 10 minutes before those 40 minutes, I would log in a little early um, and try to say hi by name to the first screen full of students who show up. Uh, once they get more than 49 on a screen, it's, it's kind of too many. Um, but I think the students appreciated that and some of them mentioned that to me. Um, then we would go into uh, announcements and then problem solving, some active learning activities, uh, some community building, uh, trying to introduce them to things outside the course by talking about some research papers and highlighting different areas where, where economics can actually be interesting beyond the, the sort of somewhat dry core material that I have to teach. Um, and I recorded this, of course, for the asynchronous participants, of which there were many. Uh, and then I would hold just open office hours for the last 40 minutes. I'd turn off the recording um, and just be there. And you know, 50 students would stick around, uh, sometimes down to 10 at the end. But uh, we'd have a sort of open talk about anything, uh, typically asking for uh, clarification on problem sets or how did you do this. Um, and I guess I should say that in addition to those off open office hours, we also held between me and the GSIs another nine hours of open office hours in the evenings um, and one hour, uh, especially for our own discussion sections on Fridays. So the students had a lot of opportunities uh, to talk with us in person. Um, the student feedback uh, on my uh, survey that I put out uh, was kind of divided between whether they preferred the asynchronous or the synchronous lectures. So I think both had some success. I personally found the synchronous live lectures over Zoom substantially more rewarding than I expected them to be because the students were very participatory through the chat, much more so than in a typical classroom. So the low light uh, first, uh, my time in sanity. This is the hardest semester I've ever endured. Um, recording and editing those asynchronous videos uh, is about a 10x multiplier. So if I'm recording 40 minutes of video, that's 400 minutes of effort, uh, maybe more. Uh, I'm still not satisfied with them. So I worked as hard as I could and couldn't get them right to some extent. And it crowded out other changes I wanted to make for the course. I do think the students got a pretty good product this semester, but I was working 80 plus hours a week to do it. So that's not sustainable, unfortunately. And I would ne wouldn't necessarily recommend it for anybody to do. Um, highlight number two is my broadcasting setup. I call it the i setup because I've got the iPad, the iPhone, and the iMac. Um, so right now I'm broadcasting to you from PowerPoint on my iPad, which is AirPlaying to Air Server on my iMac, uh, which is then a shared window within Zoom. And you're seeing me through uh, the camera on my iPhone, which of course is much better uh, than the camera on my computer. I'll switch momentarily so you can see the difference. Uh, there, that's my computer built-in camera. And here's the iPhone mounted to the top of my computer. Um, that's a huge difference. I use Camo Studio as the software for that and Zoom recognizes that as if it were, were a webcam. Uh, and I have a lav mic, uh, which maybe you can see right here. Um, and all these things work together really well uh, for the live broadcasts. Uh, I had, also, I had the, uh, the large Zoom license. So this was not a webinar, despite the, the 400 plus students. Um, I was able to let the students unmute themselves for discussion. Uh, I could have done breakout rooms and I was hoping to try that, but I, I ended up uh, not doing it this semester. Um, the next highlight was uh, the structure that I arrived at on Canvas after a few weeks. The old way that I had to do this was to organize content by modules, um, but it turned out not to be, uh, and, and this was less important in, in classroom semesters. So I, um, I didn't really think too hard about it in the past. Um, this time that didn't work out very well. The modules have kind of an inflexibility to them. They treat different types of items differently. Um, there's no place for just whatever you want to write down. Um, so I kind of ditched the modules and ended up doing a weekly to-do list. So this is the structure that students always need to always know where they need to be, what they need to be working on, uh, because these are organized by date. Uh, and so you can see, I, here's just an example of one of my weekly 
info pages with all the videos they need to watch, uh, the files to download, the assignments to complete, et cetera. Um, so that I think I didn't get too many complaints about uh, lack of structure. Um, and some of the students replied that uh, on the survey that they, they thought Canvas worked really well. On the other hand, Canvas completely failed me at one point in the course. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have handwritten exams that need to be hand graded. And so the way to do that was to have students scan and upload them. And they did this with their problem sets as well. So they got some practice before the exams and they did a pretty good job with it. But on midterm exam one, I set it up as a Canvas quiz with a file upload. Um, and we ended up exceeding the Canvas server upload limit. And so more than 100 students were unable to submit their exams on time. Um, so that was a disaster and led me to Gradescope for exams. And Gradescope turned out really wonderful. So the benefits of Gradescope, it's a much better way to upload exams for the students. We didn't have these problems. It's also better for the GSIs. We can create and apply rubrics. So the GSIs worked with me on creating the rubric, rubrics and then they would just click, click, click to apply them much easier than Canvas SpeedGrader. The students found it much easier to submit regrade requests and we found it easier to process them. There are a couple drawbacks. One is there's limited flexibility for different times for different students, which is important in a, in a big class, especially with time zone issues. And of course, the lower cost of submitting regrade requests leads to a much larger number of regrade requests. I think that's all right. Logistically, uh, we had students get their exam question from a Canvas quiz and then submit their answers separately on Gradescope. And that meant they had to be responsible for tracking their own time and we would calculate late penalties afterwards. Somewhat integrated with Canvas. Uh, and so Gradescope, uh, I highly recommend it uh, for grading exams, uh, especially if you use handwritten exams. All right, six exams is too many. My old way was two evening midterms. I always felt that was too few. The first exam comes a little too late for students to know whether they should drop. Each exam is pretty high stakes. With only three, how can I drop the lowest score really? Um, and it's easy for students to procrastinate. My new way to solve that problem uh, had good intentions, but with six mini exams, each exam has lower stakes and there's fewer questions per exam and it's easy to drop the lowest score, no problem. But this turned out to be very stressful for all of us, students, me, the GSIs. Um, there was less time to reflect because there's always a test coming up and students want me to teach the next test. And I gave up three lectures uh, in order to do this. And I ended up, I had to skip material. Of course, I knew that ahead of time, but it was still painful. Um, finally, low light number four, I think this is the biggest drawback to remote teaching. Cheating on a classroom is, exam is really hard. Very few students cheat, as far as I can tell. Cheating on a remote exam is actually very easy. So we had some countermeasures. First of all, we just said, you can look at your notes, you can look at the internet, we're not gonna call that cheating this semester. Uh, in fact, those are positive behaviors to some extent. Uh, in real life, when we're doing research, we don't uh, restrict ourselves from looking at our notes or looking at the internet. Um, I've always tried to write deep and original questions with handwritten answers, a little harder to cheat on. Um, the negative things that we did uh, gave them a tight time limit within a limit, limited time window. This doesn't have a real pedagogical justification other than trying to discourage cheating. And our department uh, collectively took a strong stance on no intrusive video monitoring. So we weren't, uh, we weren't doing any of that. The remaining concerns, I have strong circumstantial evidence that students are working together on the exams, which they're not allowed to do. Um, and I suspect, but it would be impossible to detect uh, that some students who take the exam early pass it on to others, even within the somewhat tight time window. Um, so those are kind of the lessons from my own teaching this semester. I'm gonna be talking with a lot of the faculty uh, in our department about their teaching soon. And maybe a month from now, I'll have some more collective, collective wisdom. Uh, this is just what I've learned. Thanks, David, for touching on uh, a lot of really important themes and considerations and concerns um, that come out of navigating this, this term and, and all the things that you were attempting to balance there. So we're gonna turn now to um, Farina Mir and Paulina Alberto to talk about their jointly taught course. Um, and then we'll uh, 
be able to move to Q&A. So Farina. Hey everyone, I'm Farina Mir and I'm gonna ask Paulina to just introduce herself too. Hi, I'm Paulina Alberto and I co-taught History 101 with Farina. Um, so we're going to be talking about History 101, which is an introductory level course, as suggested by the 101 moniker. Um, and it, this is a co-taught course. We uh, usually have about 200 students, so not as large as some of the courses we've heard about today, but certainly not a small seminar. I thought it would be helpful to just share with you the kind of standard structure of this course, right? It's two 80-minute a week. 80 minute lectures per week, plus one 50 minute discussion section led by our GSIs. And we had a team of three GSIs for the course. So one of the things that, that um, I thought it might also be helpful to do is give you a very quick sense of what we did with assessments in this course. Um, we had different kinds of assignments over the course of the semester, which included some that we referred to really as low stakes. And so we had six discussion posts, for example, that were usually just a paragraph or two based on something the students had read or watched. Um, and we called this low stakes writing and it had its own low stakes um, rubric, which I can share with you. Um, this is actually developed by uh, Paulina, but low stakes writing. So there were no grades for those, but rather a kind of point system of, of one to five, giving students real clarity on what constituted a five and what constituted less, giving them a lot of room for improvement over the course of the semester. But the idea behind, um, Actually, what I want to do is not go there. I wanted to go back here. So we had six discussion posts, four reading quizzes, very short, two to three questions um, had to be completed before lecture, very few points attached to those reading quizzes. And then we had a, um, a take home essay that they had to do and two take home, well, an essay is always take home, I guess, but an essay and two take home essay exams. And the important thing ab about all of this assessment is that we really mapped it onto a calendar to make sure that there was at least one touch point every week so that students were, um, we find that if there's some kind of assessment associated with an assignment, even if it's two points or 2.5% of their grade, students are inclined to actually do it, but it is a way to keep them engaged. And of course they received feedback, except for the reading quizzes, which were on Canvas and automatically graded, they received feedback on every one of these other assignments. So there, were all, there was also a mechanism of kind of them submitting work and constantly hearing back from with some kind of feedback on what they were doing. And many of these things were geared towards um, future assignments. So even their essay, which comes early in the semester, we gave them feedback on their writing, knowing that that feedback would be helpful to them for their take home essay exams. So that was the kind of structure. Um, one of the really big things Paulina and I talked about at the beginning of the semester was whether this was going to be synchronous versus asynchronous um, in the course. We actually had very different considerations for the lectures and different considerations for section. I thought it might be helpful to share that. In terms of considerations for lectures, I was really deeply committed to the idea that they be synchronous, but I was also very mindful of everything we were hearing from the um, from the dean's office, and I want to thank the dean's office for that, for giving us a clear sense of how much difficulty students were having in terms of access, um, and how these things were really differential, and if we were going to that we really needed to be mindful of students' differential access to good internet access home environments that are conducive to teaching, home environments that are in conducive to attending class um, in the ways that they can when they're on campus. On the other hand, I actually had prior experience of uh, working. Um, I participated in something called the Digital Islamic Studies curriculum for the last few years. So I had experience of teaching a course that was like with students in a room and with remote students. And so I felt confident that we could do this. But we decided to make lectures um, not synchronous versus asynchronous, but actually both simultaneously. That is, we met at our appointed time, we're there, we showed up early, we stayed afterwards to chat with students, and we held our lectures in our scheduled times, but we recorded them, we made them available immediately to students, 
and we did not require students to attend the synchronous. But I think that um, what is kind of astounding is that two thirds of our students consistently, even though they didn't have to be there, showed up. And I think that that's partly because of the modes of participation that we built in, which Paulina will talk about in a minute. Um, the considerations for discussion sections, a lot of our considerations had to do with thinking about GSI labor. And I think that's something that I haven't seen talked about in our session so far. GSIs have been complaining pretty vociferously that online training, take, online teaching takes much more time than teaching in person. And I think we all know that. And so even though some of our, our GSIs were inclined to want to do discussion sections asynchronously, because of the pedagogical goals of a discussion section, um, we felt that that would exponentially increase their time um, if they were to try and get that kind of actual participation from each and every student through an asynchronous mode, that it would actually increase their labor in ways that we did not want. So we imposed actually on our GSIs the fact that discussion sections had to be synchronous in part to contain their labor because we had seen what happens. I had seen at least in the previous semester because I was teaching what happened to GSI labor, particularly with asynchronous sections. But it was also about all of the, decision, the decisions to say synchronous were really about creating a space and a structure for students for really anchoring them in something that had some feeling of normalcy to it in a world where normalcy was really hard to find where you could still ask a question for clarification in the middle of a lecture if something didn't make sense to you. Um, and our midterm evaluation of our students, one of the things we heard for, from them is that they actually appreciated having a structure and something that approximated normal um, in terms of you know professors showing up, giving a lecture, asking for questions, um, and, and et cetera. And so the last thing I'll say is transformations due to COVID before turning it over to Paulina, and I think I'm bleeding into your time, Paulina, is that our prior structure included a significant amount of uh, their, their assessment was based on participation in lectures um, where we would use a series of eye clicker questions to keep them engaged, but also to assess, you know, were they doing the reading? And, and one of the, the transformations we made is that the 20% of their grade that used to come through participation through the lecture mode and answering eye clicker questions, we reduced that to zero. And we reapportioned that in other modes of assessment. And we changed eye clickers, which used to be part of the assessment to Zoom polls. And the Zoom polls were very popular with the students and they were really geared towards kind of learning outcomes. Um, you know, are you getting the main arguments out of the reading that's assigned for today's lecture? Are you getting the main arguments that I've made in the first half of this lecture while I'm talking to you in the second half? And so we found, again, two thirds of our students who were not required to show up consistently for every lecture showed up, which makes us think that the sort of synchronous and asynchronous simultaneity um, helps people figure out what they need and gives them the choice. And I'll pass the floor over to Paulina. Sorry, Paulina, for bleeding. <laughs> no, no problem. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Let me stop share. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So I'm just going to, you know, develop a few things that, that Farina just touched upon, but I guess I'll preface them by saying that um, for us, really, the transition to an online teaching environment um, really just amplified a concern that we already had while teaching a large 200 person course, which is how do you keep things interactive? How do you create a sense of um, engagement, community, and sort of investment on students' parts? So I think our MO um, faced with this chance to sort of adapt to the online learning environment was not to innovate in our modalities, but rather just to figure out how do we preserve the feeling of <clears throat> the feeling and the structure of the in-person lecture course as much as possible. Um, and so maybe it's a little bit fuddy-duddy, <laughs> but it worked really well, I think, because we kept to sort of our core pedagogical principles um, that we've been working on in this course for, you know, almost a decade now, I think. So we settled on three key strategies um, for engaging students and, and creating community. And these are strategies that, again, carry over from our sort of analog in-person course, but we adapted to the new environment. So the first strategy is that, um, you know, we, we circulate reading guides 
and questions for the students in advance. So one of the things we've been doing um, little by little over the years um, is that you know, we have structured our lectures around, uh, or often, not always, but often we structure lectures around a reading that students do ahead of time, whether it's an academic article or a short story or an entire monograph. Um, and so for each of these readings, we have developed these robust reading guides that we share with students ahead of time. Um, they provide a quick overview of what the lecture will cover and how it follows upon previous lectures. Um, they give a little bit of background on who the author is and what their broader goals are. Um, and then they point students to particular themes that they should be on the lookout for and questions that they should answer for themselves while they're reading and before they come to class. And so then we're able to structure um, several of the lectures in the class are really um, interactive kind of back and forth conversations for almost 80 minutes with the students around the questions that were in their reading guides, um, but that they can come in empowered to speak because they know what's going to be asked of them. And then we kind of, um, you know, in, in the classroom, we used to do that with raising hand. Um, in the Zoom environment, we sort of toggle back and forth between um, using the chat for things that are simpler questions that, that have shorter answers, and then asking students to volunteer to raise their hands for questions that are more complex. So that we were sort of pleased and surprised with how well that replicated some of the back and forth of the in-person environment. A second strategy, uh, which is similar, is to give these sort of advanced, low stakes uh, writing assignments that, that Farina just talked about in preparation for lecture. So this, for instance, would allow students to um, reflect on other material that they had covered asynchronous, asynchronously. For instance, um, in one case, they had to watch a documentary that was very um, complex in its themes. And so they could come in having thought about what to say. And again, this gives you a chance um, toward the end of the lecture or at some point in the lecture to really ask the students for their input and you're not cold calling them. You know, they've, they've all written about it. They've all thought about it. And so they have very thoughtful things to say. Um, and you can keep that fairly contained depending on how much, how much input you're getting from students. Finally, breakout rooms. Um, we used breakout rooms sparingly. We did so sometimes in the, in the spirit of a think, pair, share, a sort of short breakout room um, with a very defined goal and then they come back and they, they share out. Um, but I think the, the way that we used it to best effect, and again, this is an adaptation of something that we used to do physically in the classroom, was um, around a, an activity that we uh, basically built around um, group work that takes up an entire lecture. And I'm just gonna quickly share with you how this works in case you're interested in, in adapting it. But um, Deb was extremely helpful in helping us figure out how to move this from the you know, in-person environment to the virtual environment. But essentially what we did is we had six images we wanted to share with students and we wanted to teach them to think critically and historically about images and basically the ways in which, you know, the um, the first reading that you have of, of an image, the first impression is not always the, the sort of critical historical interpretation you want to get at. So we wanted to teach them to, to dig deeper into these images and then report out what they thought these images might be and interpret, you know, how you might interpret them historically. What are these images historical evidence of? So we, we had six images. We broke the class into um, six broad groups. So each group would get a different image. And then of course, within those groups, there were smaller groups of five because otherwise the groups would have been too big. But we essentially gave them instructions on the screen. We also sent a PDF of the images and the activity in the chat. Um, we divided them by groups based on um, the group number that uh, the breakout rooms assigned to them and that sort of told them which image they would be working on and then we gave them a very structured set of instructions for what had to happen in each group right so one person was a scribe one person was a reporter one person was a timekeeper and one or two people were critics then we gave them the actual prompts first describe what you see second in a written sentence tell us what you think this is evidence of this kind of critical thinking um, issue we were getting at. And then we had them report out their polished sentence in the chat. 
So we went through um, image group by image group, right? So the image group had smaller, sometimes up to 10 subgroups. And um, Farina and I would then, as, as, as these are coming to the chat, we would paste them into this PowerPoint. The students would have a range of choices to choose from. And at the end, in order to make sure that everyone was engaged, not just when their own image was being discussed, but when all of the images were being discussed, we asked um, the students in the class as a whole to kind of do a, a game show um, kind of activity and to vote on the answer using the poll function that they thought was the best answer, right? So the students would vote on A, B, C, D, E, F, or whatever. Um, and then Preen and I would do sort of a reveal of what that image was and we would discuss how and to what extent they, um, they had approximated the you know, an interpretation that we thought was was um, plausible. So, so I think that's one way of thinking about how to use breakout rooms, not just as a part of a lecture, but to really rethink um, an entire lecture meeting uh, to, to, to really be a fun interactive activity in which students don't really even have to hear us talk that much at all. So that's one thought, I can send more details about that. Um, but basically the big takeaway for us was, Let's not try to invent too many new things. Let's just try to adapt the existing things to the new environment. Thanks so much, Paulina. And thanks for sharing that really uh, concrete example of the, of the specific um, activity that you all implemented in, in the course. Um, before I turn things over to Matt and Moni to begin our Q&A process, I just wanted to note something that I saw across all of the panelists, which was lots of references to um, to getting midterm feedback or check-ins with students about how the course as a whole is going and, and adjustments that people made as they were going along, including things that were rethought or things that were ditched or things that were newly tried. And so just the importance of this sort of notion of, of flexibility um, that, that we've been hearing so much about uh, as we approach teaching in this environment. So Matt and Moni, I'm gonna turn things over to you to uh, pose questions. Great. Thanks. And actually, Deb, um, I was really was struck as well by the the notion of, of getting that student feedback and adjusting. And it actually then really impacts my first question to all of the panelists is how you took that feedback and really thought about that student workload and uh, what were the student responses to the, the level of of work because Tim had really talked about how in that report it really came out that that students were were feeling um, that there was much more work. So I'm I'm curious about what you what you found with student workload and how you manage that. Yeah, Farina. I mean, I can, I can respond. I mean, I think one of the things that that we did when we sat down with our GSIs and we thought about GSI workload alongside undergraduate workload. Um, and one of the things we did was that we mapped out assignments and when they're due and when GSIs have to return them on a Google calendar that was a joint one for the group. And when things were coming too close together, we actually figured out how to make some adjustments. Um, when there was just simply going to be too much work, we actually jettisoned um, you know, response, responses being due, or we tried to find the balance between our own pedagogical goals and kind of needs with the idea that students, you know, trying to be student centric in our approach that they're taking four classes at least, um, plus trying to have a life despite COVID and realizing that, you know, kind of clusters of work sometimes inadvertently happen in a course. So one mechanism that was really helpful, I think, for the GSIs also in terms of us being really cognizant of the kind of grading labor that was going to emerge was by literally mapping things out, seeing how they work, and, and making adjustments before the semester even began. But I don't feel, and Paulina, correct me, and Paulina was teaching a section, a CSP section of the course, so had more intimate contact on a weekly basis with students. But I don't feel that we got any um, pushback on questions of amount of, of student labor um, with having made these adjustments. And in, indeed, um, you know, we used to have three take home essays on uh, three take home exams in this course, and it felt like too much. And so we had we had made that adjustment in a, in a previous iteration just the last year. Um, but that was one way that really helps you see where the 
the ebbs and flows are happening and, and you have to make the adjustments um, beforehand. Yeah, David. Yeah, I, I can also speak to that. Uh, unlike uh, Arena and Paulina, I was probably a big part of the problem here with the six uh, exams. These, these exams were shorter than uh, my regular exams, but in total, it was more. And the frequency, I think, uh, was not. I, I had a few students say they liked it because they, they could always see where they were, but most of them thought it was too much. Um, and some students told me that my class was kind of overwhelming for them and took, took uh, you know, half or three quarters of all their time. Um, I think that's in part because uh, I, you know, I didn't have any um, assignments uh, that they had to do. These problem sets were ungraded. They just needed to submit something. Um, but it really could absorb you know, as much studying as they could put into it. Um, and, and some of them took that to an extreme. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe it was right for them uh, to do that, but for I, I wasn't intending to create a huge workload. It was just that there was so much that they could do to you know get continue to get a marginal improvement or expect a marginal improvement on on their exam performance. Um, yeah, I, I tried to avoid sort of busy work type things, and, and I reduced. I had plans for some extra things that I took out because of that. Yeah, Nicole. I found that one thing that was really helpful for me when midterms came around and I was thinking about adjustments was that I had laid out pretty clear course goals for my small course. And when I looked at the assignments that were aligned to each of those goals um, and thought, what could I cut? Um, it was nice because I had two different things oriented with this one goal. And so I knew that removing one of those was gonna make was going to leave other room and other assignments to to get towards that goal, but um, it was it was the fat right. So that I found really helpful. Um, I'm so glad that I had that alignment already in place. Um, the other thing about workload that I think happened for us in the the large lecture course was that one difficulty that we faced, and I suspect I suspect many of you all have was just not necessarily knowing where the, the real labor was going to come in or how much labor was gonna be involved. You know, I think David, I'm, I really resonated with your comments that this was the busiest semester you've ever had because I think um, this was incredibly intense for so many of us. Um, and so it, it took us a month or so to kind of get our feet under us with writing quizzes and preparing for exams and recording lectures. And once we had sort of gotten to an equilibrium then we could add something to it. And so that was the sort of contrast there was um, bringing in now these live sessions that we hosted um, when at a point where we felt like we had the capacity to actually be able to do that. Whereas in August, I would not have wanted to put that on my plate because I just wasn't sure I could handle it. Um, I mean, I, I didn't hesitate in removing readings from my syllabus in the sec especially in the second half, um, because I did periodically poll the students asking, you know, how the work was going. And I could tell in the reading their blog posts, um, some of them were really struggling to just focus on anything. Um, and I found that after I cut the reading by about half what I had originally planned, the conversation and the synchronous discussions just got much more, um, they just became richer. And I think people actually could do the readings at that point and we could actually have a discussion. So um, it just, I kind of took a less is more approach and it, it actually, they felt, I think, inspired to bring their knowledge to the table. Um, so I, I, I really recommend cutting as much as possible, especially in the second half. Do people have any other thoughts about that idea of what, what content you had to forego or how you made decisions about that? Can I take that one? I actually decided to, if I, if I saw something was repetitive, I, I sort of 
attempted to, to either strategically reinforce that repetition or only incorporate new material if I felt it added a complexity to the concept that we'd already really hammered out in class. Um, I made a choice to stop incorporating wholly new material in the second half of the semester because students felt I, they just seemed to be at capacity and I chose um, repetition to reinforce things and also, also to show how certain concepts um, travel in different kinds of media, how different media practices, especially in my media activism class, um, you know, you, they, you, you couldn't have two kind of case studies that were exactly alike, but it was the same concept that you could just understand in different ways. Um, and I think that that actually helped to deepen their understanding of the material instead of having a broader understanding of the material, if that makes any sense. Yeah, Paulina. We also, Freen and I also, um, cut out a couple of lectures. We normally would have had, I think, one or two more lectures, but between election day and some of the instability early on with the scholar strike and the geo strike, we ended up um, taking a couple of lectures out and then it turned out to be just, just the perfect thing. It was not so much the small assignments that I think um, exhausted people as, you know, sometimes the lectures. And we also dropped one section meeting. And I think that was a huge, breath of fresh air. Um, and some of that, um, some of those events, which were unexpected, like the, the strike early on, actually forced us to um, change the sequence of some of our lectures, which we have been, you know, honing for a long time now. And we were convinced that this was the best possible way of laying out our lectures. And we actually found to our surprise that the, the you know, being forced to move them around, um, actually worked better and showed us some of the ways that, um, you know, things we thought had to happen one way didn't necessarily have to, have to happen that way, that, that the themes were all imbricated in ways that could be picked up um, out of order. So, so that was very helpful too. I think I could, I could maybe add, it's true, it was an unintended consequence that we were very thankful for subsequently. But one of the things that we did perhaps with more emphasis um, this time around, which speaks to one of the points that has come out of the, um, out of the student report is that we, we made a concerted effort in almost every lecture, at least you know, every, every other lecture to give students a real clarity on kind of where they had been intellectually, where we were now and where we were headed. And while that might sound to any of us like we would feel like death by repetition because our course has a very particular structure with particular units, each of which relate to one another, we found that um, that was one of the things, one of the mechanisms we used um, not to necessarily, um, we were not providing, we did cut a few lectures, but I don't think that we felt like we were, we were cutting back on the content intellectually of the course, but we were much more mindful of sharing information about the structure intellectually of the course and really setting aside time to do that. And a number of slides at the beginning of lecture that literally used the, the syllabus structure to say unit one, unit two, we're now in the middle of unit three. And just in a sentence articulating what we did in this lecture, that lecture, that lecture, and now this is where we, we are. And, and um, you know, Moni, that's a response to your question. And so far as I, I don't feel like we tried necessarily to do that much less than we try in a normal semester. But I think we were just much more mindful of the difficulty of focus and, um, and student um, comprehension. And so we spent quite a bit of time there and also in our sections speaking to our GSIs to make sure students, to get some sense of, of how students were processing the material. And I think that speaks to something that one of our speakers um, also mentioned that, that the pacing and, and finding mechanisms to figure out how students are processing material, I think becomes that much more important in this environment because um, learning outcomes seemed even more uneven than usual. Yeah, go ahead, Nicole. I don't think I cut much because I was teaching 
these courses for the first time, but certainly in mapping out assignments, I took a long, hard look at the calendar and really thought about what I knew of what students would be having on their plates and working around election day. And so I deliberately planned no assignments for that week. Um, and I think overall just incorporated fewer things than I would have if we had been in person. Um, and that was such a great decision um, because I think well, for example, election week, I did offer an optional group assignment for groups that might want to still meet. Not a single group took me up on that, and uh, I'm not surprised. So um, that was, I think, a really, I'm really glad I did that. I think I heard a, a lot about sort of guideposting an organization, something Tim started with, and, and uh, Farina and Paulina, you were talking about that. Were there others, other things that folks did to sort of be more transparent than you might have in a, in a typical semester or to really emphasize the, the, the structure and, and keep students on task as you were going? I guess that was kind of the organizing principle of how I set up my Canvas site, uh, not at the beginning, uh, but after about three weeks, um, once I realized that, that that was becoming an issue. Um, so, so yeah, so, so they could always look to the to-do list and see what should they be working on this week, you know, for Thursday, what should they do on Monday afternoon? And it wasn't just deadlines. It was more like uh, here on Tuesday, download this and start working on it. Um, it's due Sunday uh, kind of thing. Um, and in terms of the, the lectures and the lecture videos, I, I would always sort of start the lecture video with the goals for that unit, finish with the summary, um, each new video we'll start with. In the last video, we did this, and now we're going to build on that kind of kind of thing to help them, you know, keep through the structure of the course. Um, and uh, I also think the Canvas calendar is actually pretty good. So whenever you create an assignment due date, uh, it shows up on the calendar automatically. And if you create a Zoom meeting, it shows up on the a scheduled Zoom meeting. It shows up on the calendar automatically. I'm not sure how many students are looking at that calendar, but I did. I, you know, I subscribed to that calendar and I could always see what was going on. Unfortunately, I could see what was going on across all uh, 17 discussion sections. Uh, so my calendar was a little polluted, but each student would only see one of those. There was a question that just came in, I think, uh, from Michael that is really good. You know, that, that the worry about winter term and not having that break of Thanksgiving in the middle and get, thinking about your workload, your GSI workload, as well as your student workloads, what are you looking forward to and thinking about for winter term to avoid that burnout since we have a couple of wellness days, but not any major break in the middle? And I don't know is a good, uh, it's a perfect. I mean, I, you know, no, I was going to say, I haven't worked it out yet. Oh my God, next semester in the syllabus already. But I will say that I was really appreciative of the wellness days um, being announced. And, um, you know, hopefully they will also be enforced because I've already gotten multiple doodle polls asking me for meetings on those days. And I've said, hello, that's a wellness day and I want to take it. Um, but I think that, that, you know, I am thinking that I might, I think, a, kind of a week off from a course is not a bad thing. And I might um, tack on to one of those wellness days, another um, you know, uh, moment in our course, but maybe use it, try and find something that, that either gives students really a genuine time out and gives them some time away from it or uses it as a point of reflection. But I think that, you know, I would most probably not be asking them to come to, you know, to, to class since I will be teaching the same synchronous asynchronous simultaneously. I'll still be doing my lectures kind of on time. I'm teaching a lecture course. Um, but I think a week off from lectures and discussion would not be a bad thing. And I may just tack it onto a wellness day. That's a off the cuff thought for now. Just to mention another approach that some folks took even in the fall um, was thinking about, are there moments in the class that are specifically not 
uh, associated with new material. And so a week that's meant to be sort of consolidation or review, and it doesn't necessarily have to always be linked to an exam, but sort of sort of a moment that does catch what where where everyone can collectively catch one's breath. And I think that, of course, the challenge here will be that there's no coordination of that. And so where one or one course does that will be not the same as where another course does that. But thinking about where it might be possible to to make that kind of opportunity possible. Question just came in um, about grading and academic rigor and, and how to deal with um, uh, alternative grading rigor due to student circumstances, which goes to some issue about flexibility on the one hand um, versus standardization is always an issue and, and how that was dealt with. And then also just other other thoughts about working with GSIs um, that that folks might have had. So, so you know, one piece of the question is um, how how do you think about exceptions, flexibility in grading in in these times? And then what do you have? What did you think about uh, working with GSIs in this environment? I'm just I'm just reading George's comment and and and, and reflecting on that. Um... I think one of the things, and, and again, I'll, I'll ask Paulina to correct me if, if, if she thinks that we did this differently. I think we really held on to the idea that we were going to provide assessments on the work that was um, germane to the, the quality of the work given. So like many people who have team GSIs, whenever there's an assignment, we take samples in and we work on them as a group to make sure that there is some um, evenness between how the GSIs are looking at things. And so we continued to do that. But I think where we brought in the accommodation of the semester at hand is we had, um, for example, a few students who had to miss exams altogether due to, due to COVID or family circumstances or any number of things. And rather than pushing them to make up the work in a context in which they were already overwhelmed, we decided to actually literally kind of give them a pass on an assignment, reapportion the assessment across the other assignments. So they all counted more. I think I would feel uncomfortable, and this maybe speaks to George's comment about what, you know, GSIs, how they handled the situation. I feel uncomfortable with giving students grades on an assignment um, or uh, on work that is not deserved. But I think there's a lot of room for generosity and flexibility on the overall grade and taking into account the circumstances. But I think it's not fair to students to give them an A on an exam that is not A work because it does not provide them any room for understanding how that work can be better in, in the future. So I think we maintained a rigor, but really heavy doses of generosity and flexibility. Paulina, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. And I would just add that, well, two things. One is that this is another great reason to have um, several low stakes kinds of writing assignments uh, and, and small quizzes and things like that, which is that you have different ways of assessing participation. So when it taught, we did, we did instruct our GSIs to, to have some flexibility in terms of thinking about well, what constitutes a good participation grade for the semester? Perhaps some students are terrified by the idea of, you know, chiming in to a section that is on Zoom, but they're happy to write something in the chat. Or maybe they don't speak a lot, but you can, but they did excellent work on their low stakes writing, right? So you can weigh that a little bit more. So we had some flexibility in that regard. The other thing, um, was that it's worth thinking about maybe as you're planning your, your syllabi for the winter, um, what are the places that you're willing to um, allow for makeup work? Uh, and if so, what is this makeup work going to look like? So for us, we realized early on, okay, if somebody misses a section, um, we had a couple of things. They, if somebody missed a lecture and, and you know, they could of course just watch it. If they missed a section, they, we would sometimes ask them to, um, to respond in writing in a very short way to the reading guide that we sent ahead of time. And then we wouldn't make the GSIs grade those, simply credit, no credit. Um, or for instance, a couple of students had to miss a quiz because of illness or something else. And so we basically, again, came up with a plan for, okay, what does it look like to make up a quiz? We're not gonna launch a new quiz, but you can answer, pick four questions from the reading guide and answer those. Um, and if you do some of that work ahead of time, 
I think it'll save you a lot of scrambling in the moment to try to figure out. And there may be categories that you don't want to make up. I think we did not let people make up exams. As Verena just said, we just, we reapportioned their grade. Well, Maya, you had your, you had your hand up just a second ago and then David. Yeah, I, I kind of did a mix of uh, some of the low stakes things like um, participation, although 20% of the grade was very flexible, students had a lot of asynchronous options. Um, and it was basically, you know, you either do it or you don't do it. And one of, what, one of the ways to get that credit was through blog posts. And there were certainly times when students would write something and they had guidelines of what, what was expected in the posts, um, essentially a reading response, but something that is shared with the class. Um, and I had students who certainly didn't kind of meet the bar for those, but they had the opportunity to make them up, right? So there were 12 opportunities throughout the semester. And let's say someone didn't get credit on the first one, they still had six additional opportunities to make that up. And then the remaining ones they could do for additional participation credit. Um, so, you know, that big chunk of their grade was essentially complete or incomplete. And I think that that helped to take the edge off of the more high stakes assignments like their midterm exam and their final project um, because they knew that they kind of had this safety net about you know 30% of their grade, 20% of participation, 30% of blog posts that if they just did those things, they would be okay. Um, and I actually think that that helped to, at least on their midterms, they were so prepared for the midterm because they had been doing these kind of low stakes things more consistently throughout the semester. So that was kind of one of the strategies I took for managing their anxiety around you know, performing well in the class and also just to make it part of the habit of just writing consistently. Um, and they really, I was impressed with the, the work that they produced um, and they really started to get good at the blog posts, especially. Great. David, you wanted to add in, um, and then Nicole. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with, with uh, what Farina said when she started off this, this segment um, that it's important to grade the work to the same standard that, that we've we've had, um, but that there's room for flexibility and, and generosity in other areas. So, so one thing that we did was we just gave them longer times to write the exam than uh, we had in the past. So normally we, they would have 80 minutes for an in-class exam or two hours for an evening exam. Um, I basically increased those by uh, 25 minutes by default and also fewer questions per exam. Uh, so each exam was smaller. So probably the time per question they have probably went up by about 50 or 60% compared to the past. Um, and they did better. Um, and then, you know, there's no particularly good reason for giving them a tight limit, tight time limit pedagogically. It's more a logistical issue. And so I'm, I'm happy they did well. Um, the other thing is with the, um, with the flexibility to drop an exam um, and, uh, sort of more bonus points than I usually have available for, for things they could do. Um, the, the curve is gonna, you know, I, I do have a curve for the course, um, but these things sort of go on after the curve. It's only the exams that are curved, not the final course grade. And so dropping one uh, and having bonus points and also an absolute homework standard uh, is gonna give them sort of more, more higher grades than in the, than in the past. Um, I guess the, some, I forget who it was, mentioned about election week. Um, I actually had an exam uh, scheduled for Thursday and I sort of assumed we would know who, was, who had won by then. Uh, when it turned out we didn't, uh, I just turned that into a uh, two day exam that they could take uh, any time in a sort of a, a 48 hour time period, which is not what I would normally do. Um, and I did it again for right before Thanksgiving when they found out that uh, they couldn't come back for winter. Um, with just a couple of days uh, notice. Um, so flexibility, I think, and, and some generosity, but without changing the standards. Thanks very much, uh, David. Uh, I'll give uh, Nicole the last word here and then we'll turn things uh, over to Tim for some final comments. Yeah, I've, I wanted to just echo this strategy of flexibility around grading, which is something that I also incorporated into both of my courses. Um, dropping a quiz, making the quizzes low stakes, generally speaking, in the lecture section so that there's no need for makeup. Um, and then uh, setting up my smaller course so that students needed to complete, say, eight out of 10 group assignments or 
uh, four out of five individual assignments. Um, so just building that in right from the get go, um, letting students know that that flexibility is there um, so that it's not a big deal if misses, which inevitably happen, had to happen. Um, despite that, I found many students completed all of the assignments. So um, I, I'm glad that I had all of those there and available, while at the same time giving that flexibility where it was needed, because it did get used. Um, and I just wanted to circle back to Georgia's sort of question that spurred this, which is thinking about GSIs, um, which is to note that I worked with two GSIs only, and actually things went very smoothly for them, as far as I can tell, this semester. But I hear from many of my colleagues in chemistry that many of their GSIs really were uh, struggling, especially first year students um, coming into U of M, not necessarily expecting their graduate school experience to look like this. And um, I'm not going to pretend like I have solutions to this, but I will be working with a larger team of GSIs next semester. And I'm planning to incorporate some of the techniques that I've been using with my undergrads, such as a weekly check-in at our staff meeting, which is something that I don't see regularly done um, among the people I talk to about this. So um, I'm hoping that small steps like that can be a help, but it seems to me that this is a larger issue um, that individual instructors, instructors alone won't necessarily be able to solve. But I'd love to be proved wrong on that too. And I want to hear everyone else's good ideas. Thank you, Nicole. And with that, Tim, I'll turn it over to you for some last words. All right. Uh, thank you so much to all of you, to the panelists and to CRLT and LSNA Tech Services for making this such a useful and even, even inspiring session. You know, so many ideas out there so many lessons learned in just the first few semesters that we've been doing this kind of work. Let me just highlight a couple of things that I heard. First of all, we've all learned or been reminded that connection is really everything. This is not something new. We even in a residential class, it's the case. But the ways we fulfill this need are new. Designing for good connections is an essential part of this. They don't happen as a matter of course in online education. So without good design, even good intentions from instructors will often fall short. But design by itself isn't enough. You also have to have delivery. So a well-designed class can be undermined by instructor missteps or a lack of commitment. So focusing on connection, really important to do. Motivation and organization, also very important for students, especially in large or complex classes. Making connections with students, of course, can be a key help with this. We heard a variety of ways to do it, including agenda-free meet and greet sections and opportunities to share what's happening in everyone's life. The key, I think, is to try several things, but perhaps also to make it clear that you know it's important to connect with students and that you want to support it, to make it a plain that that's your goal, not just to leave that as a hidden thing. I think it's amazing the way being forced to change everything has reminded us that successful teaching relies on good, inclusive course design and delivery. You know, I heard several of you talk about looking back at the list of assignments and the dates that you had them scheduled and realizing, boy, a bunch of things are kind of piled up in this week. That's the kind of design we should always be doing, and we've been driven to redo it in this environment. Um, Sometimes in the past, we felt stuck in structures that we know are, are less inclusive, pressed by, by the expectations of students or our colleagues maybe to, to cover material in lecture rather than helping students in more active, responsive, or interactive ways, being expected to use large high stakes evening exams as the only mode of evaluation. Um, sometimes some elements of what we've done in the past, you could describe as kind of rigor theater not really focused on student learning, but focused on rigid rigidity of a kind that doesn't really promote learning. So being shaken up has helped us move away from that a bit. It's helped us rethink what we do in our time together and what we do on our own time. Our first goal right now, of course, is to prepare for winter 2021, which will be a remote semester. We know enough now to deliver much more effective online courses during this term. It will be our third try at doing this after all. But I hope you all won't forget that we are going to come out of this. And when we do, we should be careful to recover what is the best of what came from the time before, fix the problems we had in that prior time, and keep the best of what we've learned in COVID times. Hopefully, we will be able to create a future which is better than ever. And in some ways, this may be the single biggest 
lifetime opportunity for you and I to transform longstanding norms and practices. I look forward very much to seeing what, what comes about in, in the course of that. And since we've run out of time, I'm gonna thank our panelists again and thank all of you for attending. Um, please share the video of this with everyone you know so that they can take advantage of it too. Hope you all have a great day.